perhaps you noticed the progression in our worship themes. Last Sunday we talked about a focused Savior requires focused followers, people who are committed to following their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This morning we take that to the next level. The focused Savior is looking for shepherds who are focused on the ministry the same way that Jesus was. And the blessings that result when that occurs. May God lead each of us into that tremendous truth this morning as we worship our Savior and see the blessing that God gives through shepherds. A good morning and a welcome to all of you. If you're using the hymnal for your order of worship, we begin on page 154. If you're participating virtually, send me a text message or an email. That information is useful to me. Let's join in singing the opening hymn. I have not loved others as I should. 
I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Son of man, 
go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and strange language, but the people of Israel, not to many peoples of obscure speech and strange language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. The word of the Lord. The psalm of the day is number 67. Today's psalm takes a little different format from what we are used to. Instead of a refrain and a psalm tone, Psalm 67 here is in the form of a hymn verse. The organist will play an introduction and then we'll join in singing it.
stand for today's gospel? The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 10. We listen as Jesus sends out 72 of his followers on a brief mission journey, giving them authority and power to carry out the work that he's given them to do. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to, go, to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. The congregation may be seated. Children, I've got a message I'd like to share with you this morning. Come on. I have something I want to show you on the screen here. so that they go to the right place to eat grass or whatever else. That's right. The shepherd uses that. Now I have another picture. Here's a picture of a shepherd. See, he's got the shepherd's staff in his hand and one of the lambs is on his shoulders. Who do you think that might be in this picture? Hmm. The good shepherd. Who's that? It's Jesus, right? I'm not sure that that's what the artist intended with that picture, but that's a pretty good guess. Jesus is the good shepherd. We hear about that in Psalm 23. And now the Bible tells us that Jesus has given his people, his sheep, shepherds today. Do you have a shepherd? You're one of Jesus' sheep, one of his lambs. He gives you a shepherd in your pastor. The word pastor actually means shepherd. Now, what does a pastor do? Well, like the shepherd does, you mentioned it, if there's danger, the shepherd pulls the sheep back to safety. That's my job. If you're in spiritual danger from sin or something else, I'm supposed to say, hey, that's not right. This is what God wants. As your shepherd, I remind you of what Jesus did for you by suffering and dying and rising again so that you can be in his fold forever, his sheep pen, forever. That's my job. And I lead you. I lead you to get food and water. Well, not the kind you eat with your, and drink with your mouth, but the kind that your 
heart your soul needs the word of God. I don't use a sh shepherd's crook like that. I use God's word, the Bible. And that's what we focus on every time we get together, right? Whether it's Sunday school or church, use the word of God. Because that's what God has given us to help us. The shepherd, the sheep. Okay, go back and sit with your parents. We'll join in singing the hymn of the day, number 901.
I'm ashamed to think of the fact that some denominations for decades have buried the sins of the clergy and have protected those who are guilty. Whom can you trust? Maybe not even your pastor. Forty years ago, the question was asked, whom can you trust? Can you trust pastors? And 70% of the respondents said, yes, yes, the pastor is a trustworthy person. That was 40 years ago. Today, just over 30% of the people would say the same thing. Wow. And I get it. We pastors have done much to ruin our reputation, to undermine the confidence that people should have in the pastoral ministry. The bottom line is that pastors, by and large, have failed to take to heart the words of Jesus regarding what he wants them to say and to do as shepherds of God's people. And this morning, we've had the blessed opportunity then to see in our readings what Jesus wants and expects of those whom he calls as shepherds. And since you are the ones whom God wants to bless through that relationship, it's important for us both to pay attention to what our God says here, to shepherds and sheep, about what he wants in the shepherd of a flock. What does Jesus want a shepherd to do? What does Jesus want out of your shepherd? Let's take a look here at these words from 1 Peter chapter 5 and see what the Lord wants. We live in a worldwide digital age. Think about it. In your hand right now is likely a device through which you can have access to worldwide information on any topic you can think of. You got a question? Want some more information? Want to know what's on the restaurant's particular menu? Just Google it. There it is. Incredible. <clears throat> that reality, along with a current distrust in pastors, has led people to think that they should be able to do the same regarding their spiritual life as well. I got a question. Really, just want a spiritual one? Well, why ask the pastor? Why not just Google it? In fact, why don't I decide for myself what God wants me to hear and to know and to believe? Why do I need a pastor at all? I can just get one digitally right here. Why have a pastor at all? Well, the easiest answer to that question is because that's what Jesus wants for you as one of his sheep. Jesus purchased you with his holy, precious blood and his innocent sufferings and death. He does not want you to be shepherdless. He wants someone to have spiritual authority, someone to watch over you spiritually. The public ministry is not an option that Christians may choose. The public ministry is something that Jesus Christ himself established. The Apostle Paul wrote, it was he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles and some to be pastors and teachers to build up God's people for works of service. Jesus established it. So back to our question, what does Jesus want out of your shepherd? Well, let's listen to Peter's directives to first century Christian pastors. He says, serve as overseers because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Be eager to serve. Be examples to the flock. Several times in those four verses, Peter talks about serving. Shepherds serving. It's the ministry. That's what the word minister means, to serve others. Willingly, Peter says. All the time. That takes commitment. That takes sacrifice. To be the shepherd of God's sheep. But just exactly does he want the shepherd to do? Well, Peter doesn't fill us in there. To answer that question, you've got to look elsewhere in Scripture. And I propose that God would have the shepherd do three things. The first is to warn. To warn the sheep. Jesus once said the path to eternal life is a very narrow road. That means the berms on either side are extremely wide. And that territory belongs to Satan. 
and Satan's number one weapon against people heading towards eternal life is false teaching. It's all over the place outside of that narrow road. And there is no such thing as a harmless false teaching. Every false teaching comes from Satan himself, and it is intended to weaken and destroy faith. There is no such thing as a harmless false teaching. Your shepherd warns you against that. He also warns you against sin because there is no such thing as a harmless sin. It's so easy because we have a sinful nature for us to get caught up in a sin, something particular. And, and since our sinful nature agrees with it, it feels like the right thing to do. But there is no such thing as a harmless sin. And so your shepherd is there to warn you against such sin because it's drawing you away from your Savior, Jesus Christ. It's harming your relationship with him. It has the propensity to rob you of your eternal life. Number one, shepherds are to warn. Number two, they are to protect. You're not just out there battling a sinful world and evil, power, powerful people. You're battling none other than Satan himself. And four verses after our text, in 1 Peter 5, Peter describes Satan as a lion prowling around looking for someone to devour. But Satan, as powerful as he is, is no match for the Almighty Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gives us his powerful word. And through that powerful word, you have protection. That protection comes as your shepherd shares with you that word. That's what your Savior wants out of your shepherd. And finally, he wants your shepherd to comfort you. Indeed, according to the 23rd Psalm, we live and move in the valley of the shadow of death. And when death strikes, it can be numbing, crushing. Your shepherd exists to share with you the comfort of God's word. What a privilege that is. But couldn't you just as well find those sections, those verses of God's word on your own when you need warning or protection or comfort? Couldn't you Google the topic? Go to a Bible version in the cloud and find what you're looking for? Well, I'm sure you could. In fact, I urge you to read scripture on your own every day. But don't go shepherdless. Because if you're shepherdless, you're a sheep out there by yourself. And a sheep by itself is an unbelievably easy target. What does Jesus want out of your shepherd? Well, it boils down to this. The shepherd needs to know his sheep, to know what their spiritual needs are, and to address those needs with the word of God. What does your shepherd, what does Jesus want out of your shepherd? He wants a shepherd who knows his sheep. Our world is becoming an increasingly do-it-yourself world, and I'm not talking about home projects. I'm talking about taking things on your own and getting them done all by yourself. For instance, when's the last time you made a hotel reservation or a flight reservation by calling up an, an agent and making a reservation, having them make a reservation for you? You don't do that anymore. You go online and you make the reservation yourself. Or when's the last time you actually spoke to someone in order to order a part for something that you need to fix? You don't do that. You go to the website, you find the item, you click on it, put it in your virtual shopping cart, pay for it with your credit card, and it arrives a few days later. It's all do it yourself. So why not do it yourself when it comes to your spiritual life? Again, I mentioned, I urge you to keep in contact with God's word daily. But don't go it alone. Because it's so easy to get fooled by your sinful nature that everything's okay with your spiritual life, your relationship with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's no one else there to warn you or to offer you correction from God's word or to sit with you. Across the table from you. With the comfort of God's word, when guilt or grief are crushing, Jesus doesn't want you to be alone. That's the way we were by nature. But he came to this earth and he redeemed you with his holy, precious blood. He made you a member of his kingdom, a sheep in his flock. 
And how he serves you through your shepherd. That's what Jesus wants your shepherd to do, to know you in order to serve you. I mentioned earlier that the public's trust in pastors has been decimated. And as I mentioned, we bring that on ourselves. I cringe every time I hear another account of a pastor abusing that relationship that he's had with his sheep. So what should pastors do? Well, look to the word of the Lord. Look what Peter here describes. Peter asks, no, he directs shepherds, you better know yourself. Because if Satan can get at you, he can get at the whole flock. So know yourself, shepherd. He says it like this. Be overseers. And do it because you're willing. Because of the first sin that Peter warns against is laziness. A seminary professor of mine once said, it's real easy to be lazy in the pastoral ministry. Why is that? Because you don't have people looking over your shoulder all the time to see what you're doing. There's no clock to punch. You don't have these quotas you got to meet. It's real easy to look busy. And the ministry is service. Service all the time. <clears throat> Willing, sacrificial. It's so easy because of my sinful nature that the default to be lazy. Peter warns against that. He says, Shepherd, know yourself. The second temptation is greed. Personally, I don't know of a single pastor who has had to leave the ministry because greed led him to steal. But I've heard that there, that there are pastors like that. No, far more often I hear of pastors who simply are looking with a covetous eye towards what they could be earning somewhere else or what another pastor is earning. You see, the cousins to greed are discontent and materialism. And Peter urges pastors, know yourself. When that's what's knocking at the door of your heart, realize it. Get rid of that greed. And finally, the third temptation is power. Peter says it like this. Not lording it over those entrusted to you. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's the ministry. And the ministry is not about lording it over other people, about exercising authority over others. The ministry is about serving. And those two things are direct opposites. But it's so easy to get drunk on power. And Peter says, know yourself. Watch out. As I mentioned, Satan knows that if he can get at me, he can have an easy time getting at you. So what are we going to do? Pray. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. Watch out. I'll watch out for you. You watch out for me. Encourage. I'll encourage you on your path to eternal life. You encourage me. And the goal is this, that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. May the chief shepherd bless us always in our relationship as pastor and members, as shepherd and sheep. He will bless us through his word as we focus our attention on that word and feed our souls on the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. Peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We join now in confessing the Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, to whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Heavenly Father, we pause this holiday weekend to remember the tremendous blessing of the freedoms we enjoy. We praise and thank you for your bountiful blessings on our country. We ask you to enable us to enjoy and use our manifold freedoms to your glory. Help us be the salt and light of the earth and empower us to use our freedom of religion to spread your saving gospel. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and serve you who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these blessings, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Please be seated for the offering.
Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll remain standing for the closing hymn. August 3rd, 
Put that on your calendars. A sign-up sheet will be posted soon. If you have any questions, the person who's heading this up is our elder Steve Watchery. He's the usher this morning. Just stop him. We welcome all to join us. Doesn't have to be a need to join us. We're looking for drivers, perhaps too. So, uh, if you have questions, see Steve. There are refreshments in the fellowship hall. We hope you'll take this opportunity to gather with us. Have a blessed day and a blessed Fourth of July. Thank you.